Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the first of what will be many Dracula-related reviews this Halloween season. Yeah, so last year I started to touch on Dracula and Nosferatu and uh, some of the other adaptations of Dracula that we've seen over the years. And, well, we're going to pick up right where we left off this year. So to kick things off, we're going to be starting with Dan Curtis's take on Dracula from 1974, starring Jack Palance. Now, this is quite an interesting take on Dracula, not just for Jack Palance's fantastic performance as the Count, but also for its influence on Dracula films that followed. So let's talk about it today on the Halloween Horror Reviews on the Multimedia Chronicles. So, starting off with 1974's Dracula starring Jack Palance, it seems that it's quite accurate to the book, at least for about the first half hour or so during all the Jonathan Harker scenes at the beginning. So, a few things that I generally keep an eye out for. Uh, is Dracula the coach driver? Well, in this case, no, he's not the coach driver. How does he greet Harker when he comes to his door? Well, he says, enter freely and of your own will, which is a phrase that I've always found really ominous in Dracula movies. Now, the thing that's always been strange about it to me is it feels like it's a callback to that old idea that a vampire can't enter your home unless you invite them in. Now, I know it's not, because the original story of Dracula far predates that idea, but I don't know. It, it just kind of feels like it's along the same lines, but the roles are reversed. Like, Dracula's inviting you in, but you have to enter of your own free will, so it's kind of like the same kind of thing, but different. I don't know. Anyway, it's always been an interesting line to me, and I'm always happy when I see it's included, because that is, of course, a line that's straight out of the book, word for word. Now, Dracula does keep Harker up quite late, and they're chatting and everything. Sadly, we don't have the ever-popular line, Listen to them, the children of the night, what music they make. In fact, I think it's one of the few adaptations of Dracula that doesn't have that line. It's always kind of fun, like a little nod to the fans to see how each actor who portrays Dracula delivers that line, because they all have their own kind of take on it. But, alas, it's not in this version. How does Harker cut himself? Well, just like in the book, he cuts himself shaving. And, just like in the book, Dracula comes into the room, but Harker doesn't see him in the mirror, and that's when he knows something ain't quite right here. So as I said, most of the Harker scene plays out much like it does in the book. He meets up with the brides, the brides attack him, Dracula pulls the brides off him and says, no, he's mine, you can have him later, blah, 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 blah. The whole thing plays out pretty much like it does in the book. But there's one significant difference in that whole sequence, and that's when Harker is showing him the pictures of the different properties that he's offering to him. Of course, he chooses Carfax. But uh, as you may recall, in a lot of the different versions, he sees a picture of Mina, and Harker says, yes, that's my fiancé, and he's quite taken with her. But in this one, he sees a group picture, which has Harker, Mina, Lucy, oh, the Lucy Westenra pseudorometer. Who's the winner this time? Arthur Holmwood. Yay! Finally, Arthur gets his time in the spotlight and, and gets the girl, yes. I don't know why, but Arthur just seems to get shafted out of most adaptations of Dracula. Either he's not in them at all, or she chooses one of the others, usually Quincy. But uh, no, in this case, it is indeed Arthur Holmwood. So Dracula's looking at the picture, and he's like, oh, who's this? And Harker naturally assumes he means Mina, because he would recognize him from the picture. He says, oh, that's my fiance, Mina. And he says, no. Not her, her, and he points to Lucy. Which, at first, in terms of this being a different thing, it doesn't really set off any red flags just yet, because, of course, we know Lucy is a pretty major part of the story. In fact, a lot of people have said it's more the story of Lucy than it is about any of the other characters. So much as in the book, he gets Jonathan to write some letters saying that he's on his way home. And once he has the letters, Harker asks him what's going to happen now. 
And Dracula just says, Now I go to England, and you go to hell. And he shoves Harker to the floor, storms out of the room, and locks him in. So Dracula leaves, and Harker is left to the mercy of of the three vampire brides. So we don't have much of the whole boat trip over. I know some movies focus on that more than others, uh, but we do get a couple of shots of the boat wrecked on the beach, the captain tied to the wheel and dead, and then just a shot of Dracula on the beach, just kind of surveying the land before him. So from there we cut to Mina heading off with Mrs. Westenra to visit with Lucy, who has fallen quite ill. And through the time-honored tradition of very rapid-fire expository dialogue, we're brought up to speed on everything that's been going on in England. They talk about the crashed ship and how mysterious that is, how Lucy's fallen ill and they don't know what's wrong with her, and how they've already invited in a specialist named Van Helsing who's already there now. Yeah, they don't waste any time getting Van Helsing on the scene. As soon as we get past the Harker scene, boom, Lucy's sick, Van Helsing's on the case. So as Van Helsing and Arthur are trying to help Lucy and figure out what's going on, we get a few scenes of Dracula coming to her in the night. And through those scenes, we get some interesting flashbacks to when Dracula was alive and his lover at the time, hundreds of years ago, who looks remarkably like Lucy. In fact, there's a painting in Castle Dracula of him when he was still alive, and he's in the middle of a battle on horseback, and there's his lover there who looks remarkably like Lucy. So yes, if you've ever seen a version of Dracula that had one of the women, either Mina or Lucy, supposedly being Dracula's lover from the past, reincarnated, this is where that came from. This is actually the very first version of Dracula ever to have the reincarnated lover subplot. So if you've ever seen that in any version of Dracula ever, looking at you, Bram Stoker's Dracula, this is where it came from. But in actuality, this isn't where it originated. Dan Curtis, who directed this, freely admits in the interviews and the extras that he basically ripped off his own storyline from Dark Shadows. Yeah, the whole reincarnated lover storyline is part of the Barnabas Collins vampire storyline from Dark Shadows, the gothic soap opera from the 60s and 70s. So this was done a few years after Dark Shadows and Dan Curtis freely admits that he shamelessly ripped off his own storyline and mishmashed it into the Dracula story. Which is interesting because the character of Dracula in the book is not a romantic character at all. He is a vicious, ruthless, pure evil killer. And we are nothing more than cattle to him. Oh yeah, there may be a little bit of passion and such just in the putting a potential victim in thrall so they'll be easier to feed on, but that's it. It's all the sham, man. I mean, there's no actual romance there. He doesn't actually care. He's out for himself, like just to, you know, prolong his own life through the taking of other lives. Now, to be fair, this Dracula is still very much that Dracula for the most part, just with the one addition of Lucy being his reincarnated lover. And if you want to date that storyline back even farther, there's, of course, 1932's movie of The Mummy with Boris Karloff, which has a very similar storyline where Ardeth Bay is pretty sure, or Imhotep, uh, is pretty sure that the, the leading lady in that is his reincarnated lover. And other than the reincarnated lover storyline, The Mummy from 1932 borrowed its plot pretty heavily from the previous year's Dracula movie. Hmm. Interesting. So any way you look at it, it all comes back to Dracula. So the story of Lucy plays out much like it has in other versions. Dracula repeatedly visits her until she dies, and then she comes back as a vampire. However, Arthur and Van Helsing track her to her tomb and put an end to her. Dracula shows up the next night, beckoning her to come to him so they can renew their eternal love, but she doesn't answer. So he goes down into the crypt and sees that she's been staked through the heart. And he goes nuts. 
he basically just trashes the whole crypt, flipping coffins all over the place. In fact, if you look closely, there's a funny shot where he flips the coffin that Lucy is in. And I guess it's still the actress in there. So you can see she quickly throws her arms up as he flips the coffin just to protect herself. So he flips the coffin and she's just like, whoop! <laughs> Blink and you'll miss it. So it's not long before Dracula, of course, targets Mina. Now, of course, the motivation is slightly different, which, which is interesting. It's almost like he's to get back at Arthur and Van Helsing for making a mess of his plans. So Van Helsing suggests putting Mina up in a hotel under the watchful eye of Mrs. Westenra while he and Arthur go off to find out where Dracula's resting place is so they can sabotage it so he won't have a safe place to go anymore and sabotage any other boxes of Earth either. It's actually Mina who tells them about the ship and how it was full of boxes of Earth and that's what sets Van Helsing and Arthur on the right path to kind of trace where those shipments went. So they all went to Carfax which of course is the property that Harker sold to Dracula. So they find and sabotage all the boxes they can, but there's still one missing, one that's unaccounted for, so they need to find that one. In the meantime, Dracula tracks Mina to the hotel and just goes on a berserker rage rampage through the hotel, killing people left and right, trying to get to her, but there's too many people there, he can't deal with them, so he decides to just take off killing a few more people along the way. He basically Jack Palance Dracula on a rampage through the hotel, man. It is quite a sight to see. So Van Helsing and Arthur get back to the hotel, hear about the rampage of this random madman. They, of course, know who it is, but the hotel people didn't know who it was. And find out that Mina and Mrs. Westenra have gone back to the house. It's like, well, he didn't get you in the hotel. Why'd you leave the hotel? So anyway, they go back to the house, and sure enough, Dracula's already there, and already attacking Mina. In fact, he's just fed on Mina, he cuts himself, forces her to drink his blood right in front of them, there's nothing they can do, and now she's in his power. So from here, it plays out kind of similarly to the book, where Mina is now connected to Dracula, so they can actually use her to figure out where he's going. Now, of course, much like the book, they determine that he's going back to Castle Dracula, so they follow him there and have their big final confrontation now another thing i always look for is okay how does dracula die in this version compared to how he dies in the book now of course in the book it's arthur and quincy who kill him just by one stabs him through the heart and one slits his throat both just with regular knives the whole stake through the heart thing didn't come until later so in this case they get to the castle they're trying to find dracula they encounter the brides they kill the brides and then they encounter harker harker is a vampire yeah that's an interesting twist that's something you don't see very often so unlike most other versions harker never made it back to england in this version he was trapped at the castle the vampire brides fed on him and turned him so now he's a vampire too interesting little side note to that there's a shot as van helsing and arthur are exploring around in the the catacombs of the castle uh where they show a, a spike pit, basically a pit just with a bunch of spikes at the bottom of it. And you can't help but think like, oh, okay, obviously that's some foreshadowing. Somebody's going to get chucked in there. So not like a minute later, Harker shows up. Oh my God, it's Harker. Oh my God, he's a vampire. And he lunges at Arthur and falls into the spike pit and he's dead. <laughs> so it's like, well, that was foreshadowing that didn't take very long to pay off. So they have their final battle with Dracula, and it's kind of a mix of how they defeat him. Like in, in the book, it's just knives. Most movies, it's just a stake through the heart. In this case, they're fighting him in one of the upper levels of the castle. They rip the curtains off the windows. Sunlight comes streaming in and paralyzes him. He can't move. He can't get out. He leans against a flipped over table, and Van Helsing grabs a spear from a nearby statue and runs Dracula through. Like, really runs him through. He actually goes right through Dracula and right through the table. So, yeah, this Van Helsing ain't messing around, man. And unlike a lot of other Draculas, he doesn't disappear in a puff of smoke or suddenly decay into a f dripping skeleton or anything like that. Nope, he just dies. And he's just basically hanging there, pinned to the table uh, with a spear through him. So just a couple of other sort of random thoughts. There was a scene earlier in the movie where uh, uh, Mrs. Westenra and Arthur were looking after 
uh, Lucy, basically guarding her to try to keep Dracula away from her. And now, of course, in the in most Dracula stories, Dracula is a shapeshifter. Not only can he turn into a bat, but he can turn into mist. He can turn into a wolf. He can assume a variety of different forms. In this case, I don't think we ever actually see him turn into a bat. He's just sort of always a man. But what he does is he actually breaks into the local zoo and gets, like, a wolf. And then sends the wolf in to attack Arthur so that he can get to Lucy. So I thought that was kind of an interesting twist on that idea. Rather than becoming an animal, he enlists the aid of animals. Even in the beginning, in the opening scene, you see... Dog, wild dogs running down the street and I thought like oh maybe when Harker is going to the castle they'll have the scene where the carriage driver stops and sends the dogs away just with the motion of his hands but no because of course the carriage driver wasn't Dracula and that scene is kind of dependent on the carriage driver being Dracula. One thing that drove me crazy throughout this entire movie was how the majority of characters pronounced Mina. Now the name is Mina it's M-I-N-A, one N, which means it's pronounced Mina. But all but one character pronounced it Minna. Minna, 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 Miss Minna, 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 Minna. It drove me crazy. And the one character who pronounced it properly, Mina, when she comes in and greets her at the beginning of the movie, Lucy. But of course she's dead now. So apparently pronouncing Mina's name correctly is a death sentence. As for the various performances, Arthur is much as you would expect him to be from the book. Van Helsing is a very different kind of Van Helsing from what we normally see. We normally see an older man, maybe a little shorter in stature. This Van Helsing was about as tall as Jack Palance, so he was literally able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. Like This this Van Helsing was probably one of the more no-nonsense kick-butt Van Helsings I've seen in any of the classic era movies, and he also had a pretty rockin' mustache. The actress who played Lucy was, was beautiful and charming, and you felt really bad when Dracula just basically slowly drained the life out of her. Harker was terrific, too. In fact, I think he was kind of a notable British actor at the time, so it was kind of a surprise to see him gone after the first 30 minutes of the movie and then reappear only briefly at the end and have a glorious death scene and of course there's jack palance holy moly he was so damn good in this like he is just a force to be reckoned with i mean at moments he's a force of nature like that hotel scene i was telling you about other times he's just cold calculating and scary as hell like this is not a Dracula you want to be messing with. You do not want to get on his bad side, man. Most of the time, very soft-spoken, very understated, very cold and deliberate. But with moments of intense, focused rage that, yeah, you, you don't want to get anywhere near him, man. Now, they actually do have some archival interviews with Jack Palance on the uh, Blu-ray here. And he talks about working on the film, and he says that um, after doing... Dracula, he was actually approached several more times later to play Dracula again, and he declined. Um, essentially because he felt like he'd already done what he wanted to do with the character, and he didn't feel it would be fair to other actors, because he felt that one of the joys of seeing the different versions of Dracula is to see the character played by different actors and seeing what they bring to it and what they contribute to the legacy of the character. It's also the fact he was a little bit method, and he said the problem for him personally was the longer he was working on the movie, the more he felt he was becoming Dracula. <laughs> so he was actually kind of relieved when it was over, and he could go back to just being Jack Palance. But you can really see that in his performance. I mean, he is totally committed to that role, and just doesn't just chew the scenery, he full-on devours the scenery. And in a glorious, wonderful way. I really didn't know what to expect when I heard there was this version of Dracula starring Jack Palance, directed by Dan Curtis of Dark Shadows fame. So I really went into this cold, and I've already watched this like three times now since getting the Blu-ray, and um, I think it's terrific. Oh, by the way, one rather significant omission from this version of Dracula, another thing I look for in all the different adaptations to sort of see their take on it there's no Renfield yeah 
There, there's no Renfield. This is one of the few versions of Dracula I've seen that doesn't have a Renfield. And honestly, it doesn't really suffer for it. Because they just kind of focus on the main story with Van Helsing and Dracula and Lucy and Mina and Arthur and Harker. And that's all it needs. Really, it works perfectly fine. And there you have it. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention was this originally premiered as a TV movie. Now, if you see the Blu-ray or DVD, you'll notice it's quite bloody. So, how could they get away with that on TV? Well, they actually had a very clever solution to that. Rather than just cut out the blood and guts parts entirely, what they did was they actually filmed alternate takes of those scenes minus the gore. Now, the gore specifically amounts to when the vampires get staked. You see them spitting up all this blood, and there's all this blood spurting out as they're getting the stake driven through their hearts. So in the TV version, it plays out exactly the same. It's a very similar performance from the actors, just no blood, and that's it. So I thought that was kind of clever that they actually went to the trouble of filming the TV version of the death scenes and the... I guess, theatrical version of the death scenes at the time. Because it did get a limited theatrical release as well. So in the extras on the Blu-ray, it actually gives you the alternate TV version of all the death scenes. So it was kind of neat to see. Anyway, I definitely recommend you check this out if you're a fan of Dracula, Dan Curtis, and or Jack Palance. It's a lot of fun, and I've actually already watched it about four times since getting it last year, and uh, I really like it a lot. So if you'd like to add it to your collection, I've included an Amazon link in the description. Thank you, as always, for your support. As you probably know, I get a few pennies for you using my link. And, um, yeah, it's good stuff. Alrighty, that is it from me to you for now. So until next time, thanks for watching. Big thanks to my Patreon sponsors, and sayonara. <laughs>